Hello and welcome to the latest edition of A View from the Bridge for the RN RMC. Uh, I'm here today on uh, a very special bridge, uh, the aircraft carrier HMS uh, Queen Elizabeth, uh, and with a very special view because behind me uh, is New York Harbor and the lower Manhattan skyline. And today I have the captain, commanding officer of HMS Queen Elizabeth, Captain Ian Feesey. Great to be on your bridge here. Stephen, welcome, thank you. What are we doing in New York? Well, I'm, I'm, we're, this is part of a you know, broader period of strategic engagement with the US. We've been in Norfolk Naval Base prior to this, Stephen, and, and here we are uh, for five days here uh, to host the Atlantic Future Forum, of course, um, but also other meetings and, and discussions with, with our strategic ally and other partners uh, across all the leaves of national power, really, whether that be cultural, economic, diplomatic and indeed, of course, military and, and cementing those relationships. Well, and, and it is indeed a very special moment. I, I joined you on the bridge here yesterday as we came in uh, to New York. And it is a big statement having a carrier like this, you know, at, just anchored off Lower Manhattan with HMS Richmond here uh, as well. Mm -hmm. We welcomed uh, Dame Karen Pierce, the British ambassador. What, what, what do you think it signals to our American hosts and allies? Well, on the back of our close relationship this this ship has with the US having done the carrier strike group deployment with with the US squadron embarked here and USS the Sullivans as part of the group it's sort of it's the continuity of that really important relationship with the US uh, as I said both militarily but but in other ways as well and and what better statement I think to have the fleet flagship sailing into such an iconic harbor such as this to, to host those events um, and it's sort of you know, for every sailor, in, you know, including myself, it's sort of hairs on the back of the neck, you know, a really proud moment for us all. Now, uh, you're marking an anniversary because I think it's almost exactly a year since you took command. Indeed. Um, d describe in a, in a sentence or two, if you can, summarize that year for me. Yeah, I mean, it's been a, a most, the most amazing experience, I think. Um, I mean, there's a function of the command and the scale, the number of people um, the activities you undertake, but also I think the convening power of this platform, um, not just with allies and partners, but also the response from adversaries on the deployment last year and the interest it piques, uh, for whether that be in, in a military way or, or in other ways. Um, it's been an amazing experience. Um, and I think everyone who serves here feels that. Um, it being not only the, the strike carrier, but the flagship comes with a, a responsibility and duties to carry out just as we are here this week. So, I mean, Op Fortis was a, a huge undertaking, a, a massive endeavor. I mean, now with a bit of time to look back at what was done in 2021, what, what, what do you think is the legacy of that deployment last year? Uh, I mean, I think for, for the Navy, it's, it's sort of, moving back into you know traditional power projection um being able to prove to proving to everyone that we can operate at range at, at scale uh at, at, and interact and operate with allies and partners in in regions of the world that perhaps we haven't visited uh with that frequency or that mass before um and i think it's had a real effect the sorts of visits we've had to the ship and, and the ships of the group since we've been back in uk from the regions of the world which we visited last year sort of indicates um, uh, a sort of feedback loop which which tells us that we've we've, we've had some success um, uh, and that the, the uk is a, a is a really valued ally in that part of the world now i mean you talk about the importance of the partnerships and uh, embarked on your ship you had american jets and, and american aviators yeah. um, I mean, could you tell them apart from your own team? Were, were there cultural differences? How did those two units work alongside yeah. each other? Um, so we had nearly 350 US Marines embark, 10 of their F-35Bs to complement the, the, uh, the UK jets. Um, and, you know, from a, from a tactical operation perspective, it, it's almost seamless. Um, of course, as, a, as our closest ally, as another NATO nation operating the same uh, airframe, from a carrier it, it is something the US know really well. And, and as a result of that, the operation of the air wing uh, as a joint effort was, was almost seamless. 
Of course, there are, there, there are cultural differences between us and the United States, but it was a real shared endeavor in every way, uh, not just in the ship with the air wing, but also having you know, a US cruiser, USS the Sullivans uh, um, with us throughout, not just for the deployment, but in the workup phase. Um, I, I think it was a real success story in, in interchanging uh, units with Did, with did you learn from each other? I mean, yeah, were of there... Course, of course, you know, the, the US have fantastic capabilities and methodologies that, you know, it's really useful to, to ask ourselves the question, is that the way we wish to do things? Could we do things better or differently? Uh, of course, I, I think... We're, we're in a period where we must exploit every opportunity to, to question our, our abilities and capabilities and, and, and work out whether our allies and partners can help us do things in a different way, um, you know, for, for, to, to overcome what, whatever it is um, we're asked to do. So, so I think it's, a really, it's been a real success story, and I think we achieved more um, than, we, than we probably thought we might. Now, I mean, this ship was specifically designed for the F-35B. Um, how did the aircraft do last year? Um, I mean, for, you know, people often talk about, you know, the amount of, you know, it's quite a high maintenance aircraft and, yeah. and just the availability. But, but what's, what's been the lived experience with that airframe? I, I think we, we achieved a very high tempo of, of flying activity on the deployment, which is, which is testament to, you know, the maintainers from 617, both RAF and Navy, as you know, a 50-50 split on that squadron. Um, but it, it's, it's testament to their hard work and their, their, um, their commitment on board to, to deliver those airframes. And actually, I think everyone agrees that the availability rate for the embarked air wing was, was higher than it has been ashore, only because you've got a focused team and there's focused outputs and, 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 train, and uh, training or strategic objectives that we're getting after with our activity. Uh, and I think people really get behind that and galvanize behind uh, un, an understanding of the importance of the activity that we were undertaking for UK in, in, in various regions of the world last year. Now, sadly, towards the end of the deployment, mm. uh, I know we lost one of the F-35Bs. And I know you can't talk about the detail of that, but, but what was the impact on, on the team? I, I think you were here on the bridge I as was. that happened. I was. I think, um, you know, we do training. You, you train all the time for, for the worst case. Um, and of course, the responses in training exercises you, you, you expect and you demand uh, people to, to train out um, uh, the, the shock of capture and the shock of an event so that we train to procedure. Um, but, you, you know, sailors, airmen, soldiers, people of the armed services, when the worst happens, it's when, you know, their finest uh, side comes out. And, and, you know, the team reacted, you know, flawlessly in, in, in dealing with the incident and, and overcoming. In fact, the aircraft, the, the flight deck was, was open again for fixed wing flying only a few hours later, uh, which is testament to the ability of everyone to overcome those things. And I think, you know, it is an unfortunate event and no one would wish that to happen again. But we have to remember that we're a, we're a first world Navy doing high end activities at a very high tempo. And, and this is, these things do happen um, and we should, you know, we shouldn't be complacent, of course, but we should, you know, learn from those experiences to prevent it happening frequently. But in many ways, doing dangerous things, it's, it's a when, not an if. And importantly, the pilot was fine, wasn't he's he? He's absolutely fine. Yeah. yeah. In fact, he's the only pilot, I think, who's ejected in the Navy for a long time. He didn't get wet. <laughs> right. Um, now, this, this ship, Queen Elizabeth, um, five years at sea now. Mm. Uh, how, how is she doing? And... You know, are, are there things that, you know, with hindsight, you would have liked to be different in the design or things that you could improve? Well, of course, there are always things you, you would wish to, to change subtly. But, but I think, you know, she's five years in now. We've achieved so much in that five years. I mean, from sort of flash to bang, if you will, from, from build to fortis, the inaugural deployment, the successes we've had. Uh, and the proving of the system uh, and the ability to integrate the air wing and the ship and deploy at range um, it, it has, been, has, has been really impressive. And I, I've only been here for the, for the last phase, but, but you know, testament to all those who've gone before in the build program and in the trials program um, to deliver it and hit that um, deployment milestone last year in the face of huge adversity uh, with COVID, uh, both in UK, on the ship, and, and in the world at large, when we were deploying, it, it required an, a, a huge effort to, to continue to deliver that. 
and the ship feels like has a tempo and a rhythm now we're into five years into the ship's life as you say and you know we are you know we're we're, we're each of us that serves here are, are here for you know but a stitch of of, of the fabric of, of the life of the ship which hopefully will be a, around 50 years um you know what does queen elizabeth 2.0 look like in 10 or 15 years with new capabilities uncrewed systems it's going to be a real journey and and we're really only we're barely at the end of the beginning now i'm embarked uh, with, with you here my capacity as director of the atlantic future forum which we were going to have on uh, the sister ship hms prince wales um, some technical difficulties which everybody knows about but importantly your ship deployed in a matter of days to fill that tasking what, what does that say about the value of a two carrier navy and really the resilience that actually exists within the system yeah um well i mean and the carrier uh, the, the, the concept of operating the carriers is that you've always got a carrier uh, a very high readiness and, and queen elizabeth is a very high readiness strike carrier at five days notice to move and and we were activated to come and fulfilled this tasking and, and that's exactly what we're here to do and and every person on board knows that we're at that notice to fulfill whatever the tasking might be but I think there's a point to make about the sort of shared endeavor between the two ships you know Prince of Wales is ship's company you know an unfortunate um, uh, engineering issue for them but I think it's testament to Prince of Wales is ship's company and the hard work they did in planning for the events here that we were so seamlessly able to pick up the pick up the baton and, and run with it uh, at, at, at the pace that everyone needed. Um, you know, that we work hard on having the ships really closely aligned um, so that we can overcome those things. It's, it's a sort of enterprise approach, really, which I think is the, probably the best way to, to achieve it. Well, I'm very much in your debt. So, <laughs> so thank you for making the, making the appointment. Not at all. Can we just finally talk a bit about your people? Uh, I think right now there's about 800 ships company uh, embarked. Uh, for most of them, I think their first visit to New York, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, we've got a, a yeah, I think we're closer to 900 actually uh, uh, now with a, with a few augmentees. And, and indeed, we brought some of Prince of Wales's team to help us here. Um, so they get to experience New York and, and help us deliver some of the events. But, but yeah, I mean, they, everyone's hugely proud. It comes at a very, um, you know, quite a moving time for the ship. You know, we've recently uh, the sad passing of, uh, of Queen Elizabeth, um, not only our late sovereign, but also the ship's lady sponsor. Um, and that's been quite an emotional and moving time for a ship's company who, who take the relationship, our special relationship with the royal household very seriously. And, and we have a, a, a reputation to uphold. So I think everyone's hugely proud shortly after those, those events of national mourning to be here um, you know, uh, uh, in their number ones, entering New York Harbor, delivering exactly what Her Late Majesty would have wanted, um, you know, putting out there with Global Britain and uh, uh, um, with our strategic partner. So it, it's a real poignant time for the ship. Uh, and everyone is, is really enthused, not only to get ashore in New York, I think, but just to be a part of it, because it's, it's quite something. It is. Um, we're doing this on behalf of the charity, the RNRMC. I, I know you've been a, a, a key supporter yeah. but what, what does the charity do for the ship and the serving community here how does that relationship work yeah i mean it's it's um the relationship with rnrmc is it's they're so sort of baked into um the lived experience of our sailors and 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 of course many of our sailors won't realize that day to day but there's so many things that the charity support whether that be funding for things or or domestic improvements and just making the lived experience of not only the sailors, but also their families in supporting some of, some of the endeavors for families, um, uh, the best it can be. You know, naval life, we ask a lot of our people um, and, and their families. And, and I think the, the charity delivers so much to make that, help us to make that the best lived experience. Um, and, you know, in so many different ways. Um, it's, it's, it's really, a, really a, fantastic, um, a fantastic charity that, that, that support our people. Well, and I know you're going to be hosting uh, the RNRMC Ball. We are. Uh, here in December. Yeah. So it's quite a lot happening in your hangar deck. We, it's set up today for a summit, in yes. effect, a UK-US summit. Yeah. But, but it's going to do a ball as well. It is, yeah. And, and you know, really important that we, we, we support the RNRMC in their fundraising activities to be able to continue that cycle of support uh, to, to Navy and Royal Marines personnel 
um, that you know through 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 that that fundraising. But I think you know this is this is what we do. I mean, um, launching jets is one end of the spectrum, the sort of hard power aspect, but the soft power aspect of being able to host summits and conferences and you know charity fundraising is of equal importance at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, and I think we shouldn't forget that. And, and indeed, the sailors take real pride in being able to deliver high-end hosting, catering. You know, so they take it as a real professional activity here, um, as do all the ships, as do Richmond, you know, hosting events alongside here in New York. So, um, you know, it's part of the fabric of the Navy, hosting events alongside in ports. It's been the same for generations and, and I hope generations to come. Well, and I know today we've got the Royal Marines Band uh, have flown out to be with us. They're in Lower Manhattan as they we are. speak yeah. uh, at the 9-11 uh, Memorial yeah. Yeah. being laying a wreath there today. So it really is, it is very special. Yeah, hugely special. And, and I think it's a, you know, the, the sailors will have memories from this, you know, real poignant memories of, of their time in the service. And what better memory than being in the flagship when it came to New York? Okay. We're almost out of time, but just a, a quick look ahead. What, what is in the program for the flagship? And uh, what are you expecting to do as we head into next year? Uh, of course, well, as you know, Stephen, as we've said, you know, with a, with a very high readiness strike carrier, five days notice to move. So who knows what's around the corner? And we must always be prepared for that. But in programmatic terms, we're, we're heading back to UK uh, or in the UK area of operation uh, towards the homeland this, this, this autumn. We've got a period with the Air Wing Embark to conduct some activity with other allies and partners uh, closer to Europe. Um, and, and that's sort of our period for the autumn. And next year we need to you know, keep that drumbeat of training and, uh, and exercises uh, ongoing in the early part of the year. Um, and then I'm sure there'll be some operational activity later next year. Uh, and it's all about for the team just keeping, keeping ourselves at a readiness profile, both materially, training uh, and workforce to, to make sure we can deliver that. Ian, thank you. Thank you for sparing the time. Not at all. A very, very busy visit. <laughs> Good luck with it, with the rest of it. And uh, thank you for your support of the airfield. Not at all. Also. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for watching. And uh, hopefully we'll be back soon with another view from the bridge. Goodbye. <laughs>